Never mind, America's got talent. Greystone's got talent. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. How's everybody doing tonight, all right? Seems like I haven't been here forever because we didn't wear a hair Monday, huh? Wow. Yeah, right? All right. Yeah, give me a minute to get to that scripture. We're going to start in Isaiah chapter 43. As always, the Holy Spirit will be taken over as I go into these scriptures. And I pray that this message reaches around the world and brings salvation to someone through the word of God. Amen? Amen. All right, just give me a second here as my Bible's downloading. So we can get to this. Take a couple of minutes. All right. There we go. Isaiah, there we go. 43. Okay. Verses 1 and 2. Let's see if we're going to go further than that. Let's see what we got here. The Savior of Israel. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Amen. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. What is the deep waters? When we go through trials and troubles, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. The devil wants to think that we're going to get snuffed out. But no matter what we're going through, he's going to bring us out. And we're going to come out better than we were before. Like it says, the bird with the broken wing can fly even higher. So that's what he does. He breaks us, and then he builds us up again, even stronger. That's how he works. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. What a father in heaven we have. He's pre we're so precious to him. He loves us. Just imagine the unconditional love of God. He loves us so much. We always take for granted that unconditional love. We always think he's judging us or he's mad at us, but he just loves us so much and he has to do what he has to do to us to get us to where we have to be. That's the way he does. Right? I traded their lives for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Do not be afraid for I am with you. Again, he says it. I will gather you and your children from east and west. I will say to the north and south, bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth. Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who, had, who created them. Bring out the people who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. Gather the nations together. Assemble the peoples of the world which of their idols has ever foretold such things? And which can predict what will happen tomorrow? Where are the witness of such predictions? And who can verify that they spoke the truth? But you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me. Believe in me and understand that I alone am God there is no other God. There never has been, and there never will be. I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. How about a big amen there? 
We belong to him. There's nothing we could do to get out of his love and care. He might chasten us and discipline us, but at the end of the day, he forgives us and he loves us all over again. Every day we get a fresh start. You know, it's about time that we grow up as Christian and give ourselves a fresh start each day and other people. We just always condemning and harsh on ourselves and other people, not understanding that he's not doing that to us. Why are we doing it to us? Why are we beating ourselves up? Why are we beating others up? He says, I forgave you everything. I gave you a fresh start every day. I want you to, every day you wake up, just forget yesterday and remember that I'm not chosen. You're, you're chosen by me and I love you and heaven's going to be your home. And just bank on that instead of always, mm, it's a John day. Nobody loves me today. It's like God loves you. That's all that really matters is that you please him. Listen, don't try to please people because they're not going to be able to. Just please your Lord. But you please him by what? Living the way he wants you to live. That's how you please him. You don't please him any other way but by living and, and giving your life to him. That's how you please him. I'm a big amen there. We don't work for salvation, but salvation works. All right. Remember where we left off? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Why is Chapter 20, verse 20, right? Yeah, I got chapter 2. Chapter 2, right? Yes. I'm sorry. Verse 20. Yes, there we go. I was looking at chapter 3 and I'm saying, there's no choice, it's not 20 chapters, it's not 20 chapters. There's not even 20 chapters in there. How can it be chapter 3? We gotta go into chapter 3 tonight. All right. We're gonna go to verse 19 and come down. But God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. I put a big amen there. It's quote number 16.5 there. And all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. Isaiah 52.11. So if we belong to Jesus, our evidence is that we're turning away from evil. That proves that we belong to him. Look at verse 20. As a matter of fact, before we go to verse 20, I just want to say something about verse 19. False teachers still spout lies right now, okay? Some distort the truth, some delude it. And some simply reject it by saying that God's truth no longer applies. But no matter how many people follow those who twist scripture, the solid foundation of God's truth never changes. The word of God never changes, is never shaken, and will never fade. When we follow God's truth, we will live God's way. How about a big amen there? All right, look at verse 20. <clears throat> In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. Now, we could use that example of everybody's got that hutch and then anything comes out maybe for the holidays and there's so much dust on it, you've got to wash everything before you can put it out because nobody ever uses it. But it says those are for special occasions, right? And it says the expensive utensils are used for special occasions and the cheap ones are for everyday use. Now, look at verse 21. If you keep yourself pure, now this is something that you have to do. It's a choice you have to make every day. You will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. How about a big amen there? It says if you keep yourself clean, you see it? If you keep yourself pure. So we have to what? That's a, something that we have to do every day. You have to make a choice whether you want to live for God or the devil every day. Every day you have to make that choice and that decision. And if you want to be used for God and you want him to reveal more and more to you in your life, you have to keep yourself pure so you'll be a special utensil for the Lord. 
You see, there's not just regular everyday utensils or like there's people that come on Sunday. That's the regular utensils. But the ones we use, the special utensils are the ones that are what? Working and fine. Because listen, there's not everybody's a soldier. All right, we have to protect. Some are soldiers, some are not. Some are just what? We have to what? Take care of the ones that aren't. That's the way it works though. We're spe look, the ones that are sitting here tonight are special utensils. Why? Because we're in the army. We're, we're fighting the war. We're keeping the rest of the flock pure. We're, we're taking care of them. We're protecting them, so to speak. Amen? Not, everybody, not everybody's in the army. Just like in America, right? They have an army and what? That protects the civilians. It's the same thing in the Christian faith. There's soldiers like us that are learning the Bible and studying it and growing. We shouldn't expect everybody to be that way because it's not going to be that way. But everybody has a gift. But the special utensils are the ones that are here all the time, reading the word, studying the word, eager to serve God. Can I get an amen here? It says your life will be clean. You have to clean up your life. That's what we do on Monday. We clean it up. And you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work, right? You have to catch the fish before you clean it, right? First, the evangelist comes, tells people about Jesus, gets them to the church, and the pastor what? Cleans the fish by what? Cleaning them with the washing of the word of God, right? And then we work on ourselves, which we offer that on Monday, to see what garbage is in there that needs to go and what needs to stay. And then we what? And then, the, then when we're ready, the, God can use us. You can't just get saved and go work for the Lord. It doesn't work that way. First, you have to grow. Now, listen. <laughs> Here, Paul urged Timothy to be the kind of person Christ could use for his noblest purposes. Don't settle for less than God's highest and best. Okay? Listen to me now. Allow him to use you as an instrument of his will. You can do this by staying close to him and keeping yourself pure so that sin and its consequences do not get in the way of what he wants to do in your life. Can I get an amen here? Stay away from pornography, in illicit movies, shows and books, seek godly fellowship, invite believing friends over to the fellowship, to encourage one another in your walk with the Lord, God can redeem any situation. But staying close to Christ allows you to be a good and faithful servant. How about an amen there? Ready to be used by him at a moment's notice. We know the things we need to stay away from. The lustful things, the things of the flesh that what always get in the way of serving the Lord. And the special one is the pornography thing. Everybody thinks that that's not a big issue. Listen, don't, don't get involved with pornography and then think you're going to serve the Lord. It's not going to work. So you have to what? Purify yourself for that. And well, how do you do that? By starving it. Don't go near it. Throw out your computer if you have to. Be involved. Stay close to people so you can't make no provision from the flesh. How do I know that? Look at verse 22. It says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. That's what it does, right? Instead, instead of doing that, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. So how do we overcome these things? By staying in the light. Don't make provisions for the flesh where you have opportunities to be alone, opportunity to do the things that you know are not good for you. Make yourself always accountable and available and realize that God's always watching. You're taking Jesus into it with you. Look at all the warning signs, knowing that that's going to destroy your life. If you get involved with the sexual stuff, it's going to destroy your life, and eventually it's going to come out and it's going to embarrass you. Can I get any men here? It's not talked about enough in churches. That's why everybody still does it. It's the, one of the biggest sins in the Bible. It says That's the biggest sin in the Bible because it's a sin against your own body and the body of Christ. Just imagine you're taking Jesus to the porn scene. That's what you're doing. You're taking him to a porn site because he's inside you. When you think like this, you say, you know what? I'm not going to do that to Jesus. He died for me. He loves me. Why would I want to do that to my Savior when he died for me? Why would I want to take him onto a website that's going to show that illicit stuff that's going to, what, make me dirty again? I'm going to big amen here. Amen. 
It's one of the biggest things going on in the church today. Verse 22. Running away is sometimes considered cowardly. Listen to me now. But wise people realize that removing yourself physically from temptation can often be the most courageous action to take. Timothy, a young man, was warned to run from anything that produced evil thoughts. Do you have a reoccurring temptation that you find difficult to resist? Remove yourself physically from any situation that stimulates, stimulates your desire to sin. Knowing when to, knowing when to run is as important in spiritual battle as knowing when and how to fight. You know when you're going to run. That's why, personally, I'll say, I'll give you a testimony myself. I won't. I used to go to the gym all the time, and I said, I won't go to the gym anymore. Because all it does is, all it is, is like people running around half naked, not doing anything, and, and then showing off, and like, how's a man, a man not going to look? So I have to stay away from it. So I just stay home, go downstairs in my little gym, work out there, and my wife is right there, and I'm safe. <laughs> I'm safe. You know what I'm talking about, men and women. There's too much temptation there. So if you want to purify yourself, you can't go there. It's just the way it is. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen to that. Yeah. I mean, especially in America, the way women are. I mean, please. Hey. Everything's glued to them. <laughs> Everything's glued to them, so you might as well, like, it's like they're not wearing it because it's glued to them. But I mean, any red-blooded American man knows that they can't be like be around stuff like that all the time because that's too much of a temptation for us. Yes. Be real about it. Come on now. <laughs> None of us are strong enough to resist that. Let me tell you something. That's one of the biggest addictions there is. Women. Quiet, right? We already know. The men know. If you want to serve the Lord, you can't. <laughs> you can't serve the devil and the Lord together. No, you can't. No, you can't. You're only fooling yourself. Now look at verse 23. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. All right. You see what it says right here? Do you want to be a servant of the Lord? It says a servant of the Lord must not quarrel or be argumentative with people, but must be kind to everyone. Not just people in church. Right? Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. You understand, God puts diff difficult people in our lives to grow us up so we can be patient with them. And most of the time, we don't want them around. <laughs> it's the truth. It tells us to be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Now it says, look what it says, perhaps God will change those people's hearts. The problem is, we try to change people's hearts by getting on them and saying, this is the scripture, this is what it says, this is what you should do. Only God can get in there. You can't. You can't. This is what causes fights with people. It says, perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Look what it says in verse 26. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. You realize that the unbelieving world is under the trap of the devil? That's why they don't want nothing to do with church. Why do they want nothing to do with the church? Because they see the apostasy and the hypocrisy. They see everybody living whatever way they want, just like unbelievers live. Doing the porn thing, doing the lust scene, doing the cheating thing, doing all these things. And they want to speak, oh, what, what's different on you? What's Jesus doing for you? Is he changing you? I don't see no change. That's why it's so important to live right. But here's the thing about integrity. It's doing the right thing when nobody's looking. That's how you know you're growing. When that comes, that temptation comes, and you're all alone, and what? Temptation, desire, and opportunity meet. 
run. Get on the phone, leave, go somewhere, do something else before it gets you. Because once you entertain a thought, it's going to give birth to an action. You have to know yourself. Some people set themselves up so they can do the sin. If you're smart, you won't do that. You know what I'm talking about. Nobody's dumb to this. We all made up of the same stuff now. Let's be real here. Yeah. It says, then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. Can a believer be in the devil's trap? Yeah. When they set themselves up to be alone, let the temptation get into their head to click on that site and want something nasty that nobody's around thinking nobody sees it. But guess who does see it? God sees it and you're with Jesus while you're doing it. Unless you don't believe in the Holy Spirit and Jesus, because obviously you don't if you can do that right with them. Think about it. If you can get on a porn site with Jesus, then maybe you don't believe in him. How about a big amen here? I'm trying to help here. This is something that we need to talk about because it's destroying the churches. It really is. How about a big amen here? For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Once the devil has you in his trap, once, sin, once you open the door to sin, he just keeps on hammering us so we keep sinning. One thing leads to another, another, another. Next thing you know, we're in full-blown living in sin all over again. All it takes is one compromise. Because you know what? The devil makes you think you got away with it. And then he wants you to do something else. And then something else. And then something else. And then you start to get cold towards the church. Because your sin is grabbing you again. So now you get cold to the things of God. Because sin is starting to control you again, not the sun. See, the sun, which is the Bible, controls you. You're all set. But when sin starts to creep in and control you, the devil's got you again. He's got a hold of you. The problem is, once he gets a hold of us, it's hard to get out of it. It's hard to get that relationship back with Jesus. Because our hearts get hardened. It gets hard. It says, make sure that no a, a, a root of bitterness grows up, making our hearts hard again. We get bitter. See, our sins make us bitter because we actually get bitter at God because we're still committing them. Not knowing that we're still choosing to do it. God says you don't have to. You're still choosing to. He doesn't take away our free will. So the first one we blame is God. Instead of going to him for help, we reject him and go back to the devil again. He's a snake and he's a serpent and he, he loves to get Christians that are what? Not growing back in his trap again. Playing church. What does it take? It takes repentance and confession and bringing it to the light so it can die again. Now, in verses 23 to 26, as a teacher, Timothy helped those who were confused about the truth. Paul's arguments, whether you are a teaching Sunday school, leading a Bible study with friends, or devotions with your family, or preaching in church, remember to listen to people's questions and treat them respectfully while avoiding foolish debates. If you do this, those who oppose you will be more willing to hear what you have to say and perhaps turn from their error. Once you start getting argumentative with them, they're, they're already done. They're already what, not, not listening to you anymore. You can't convince them. You have to what? Be gentle with them. Because whatever people do, it's real for them. You have to understand, what people are believing, even if it's a lie, it's real for them. They're believing the lie. So you have to understand, in order for them to not to believe the lie, you have to get them into the word of God again. You've got to get them back to the, the roots of the Bible. That's the only thing that can fix it. How about a big amen here? All right, let's go on to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Ooh. <laughs> this, is a, this is a powerful chapter. I've got to summarize a little bit on this chapter. Yeah, this is... This, there's, gonna, there's a lot here. We've got to really pay attention now, okay? In 2 Timothy 3, listen now, we are reminded that even in times of escalating deception and moral decay, 
The sacred scriptures stand firm as our grounding anchor. Remember now, these writings breathed out by God himself equip us to discern truth from falsehood, guide our lives, and prepare us for all good works. Okay? The chapter encourages us to emulate Timothy, preserving in our faith and remaining committed to God's word amidst, amidst adversity. All right, we did a big study on adversity for a while. We have to understand we're going to go through adversity while we're growing. All right, so in section one, it talks about the dangers of the last days, verses one to five. Paul vividly describes the societal and moral decline in the last days, okay? Emunating the character traits of people, lovers of themselves, and money, boastful, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Wow. We're there. And he's not talking just about unbelievers. He's talking about believers here. He's talking about believers that are living this way. They are turning. People are changing. No longer want to hear sound doctrine. They don't want to hear the truth that could what? Change their lives. They don't want to change. Remember when he was talking about um, the potter and the clay? Oh, don't bother. We don't, we're not going to listen anyway. We're going to do what we want anyway. We're not listening to you, Jeremiah. In section 2, it talks about deceptive false teachers in verses 6 to 9. Listen now. Paul warns Timothy about false teachers who exploit vulnerable people while straying from the truth. He likens these deceivers to Janus and Jambres who opposed Moses in Egypt. Remember? And in section 3, Timothy's spiritual heritage He's talking about in verses 10 to 12. Paul highlights the example he himself set for Timothy, pointing to his teaching, way of life, purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, and the persecutions and sufferings he endured. He reiterates that anyone living a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So if you're getting persecuted, that's a good thing because that means you're living a godly life. If nobody's bothering you, if the devil's not bothering you, it's because you're running with him. Because we're living in the devil's world. We're going to get persecuted for wanting to stay godly and clean. People are going to hate us, even Christians, because they're not living godly and clean. The Christians are going to get mad at us, calling us, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? How come you're not enjoying your life? You're saved. You're going to heaven. I am enjoying my life. That's why I'm in church. When you got the Holy Spirit, this is my enjoyment. Oh, in the world, there's nothing to enjoy out there. It's a bunch of problems. Everything has a price out there. The Bible tells us not to love the things of the world or the thing it offers. Because the things of the world keep our flesh alive. And unfortunately, the churches today are keeping the flesh alive. That's why people are going to them. Ooh, that smoke show, that concert was great. Wow, the worship was awesome. Did they talk about Jesus? Well, not that much. I mean, a couple of verses, but it was awesome watching that. It was like going to the rock concert. But we don't come to church to get our flesh gratified. We come to get our flesh crucified. But people don't want to crucify their flesh. You see it in the last days. This is what's going to happen. I put a big amen. And now in section 4, they're going to talk about the power of Scripture. Verses 13 to 17, Paul emphasizes the significance of the Scriptures, encourages Timothy to remain faithful, firm in what he has learned from them. He states that all Scripture is God-breathed, Genesis 2, and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
So 2 Timothy 3 is a chapter of stark contrast that highlights the escalating dangers and deceptions of the last days while underscoring the paramount importance of scripture and spiritual steadfastness. Apostle Paul writing to the young protege Timothy offers prophetic insights into the moral decay of the end times, instructs Timothy on how to remain grounded in the faith, and emphasizes the transformative power of the Holy Scriptures through the Word of God. All right, let's break into this. Okay. The dangers of the last days. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. Now, before we go on, Paul's reference to the last days reveals his sense of urgency, okay? The last days begin after Jesus' resurrection, right, when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers at Pentecost. This period will continue until Christ's second coming. This means that we are living in the last days, okay? Therefore, we should make the most of the time that God has given us. Ephesians 5, 5 16 tells us this in Colossians 4, 5. Now look at verse 2. For people will love only themselves and their money. The greed that's going on today in the world, it's crazy. I mean, people are making billions and billions of dollars while other people are suffering because of it. And we're talking about Christians, too, here. Jesus didn't even have any money. Look what it says now. They'll be boastful and proud. They still will be boastful and proud about what they own, about their, what their abilities are and their capabilities here. Right? Boastful and proud. Scoffing at God. Disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. Wow, if that don't spell out society today, they will consider nothing sacred. Right now, America considers nothing sacred. Right now, nothing sacred. They're selling churches off and making hair salons and apartments out of them instead of they used to be sacred. Nobody would go near a church. Even when I was a punk kid, I never went near churches. I stayed away from churches. Because that was holy ground. Everybody knew that. Now people are coming in shooting them up like nothing. Not even thinking that there's a God. There's like there's no price to pay for that. It's crazy. It's definitely the, <laughs> that's what it says. Consider nothing sick. Look what it says. They will be unloving and unforgiven. You know what's sad? Why is there still Christians that are unloving and unforgiven? That's how you know. Judgment's going to start in God's house. Because the sin has crept its way back into the church. We should be the first ones to be able to forgive. The first ones. Because we've been forgiven everything. If you look in the mirror and see the evil that you've been from, from the day you were born, and God forgave you every evil thought, every evil action, every evil deed that you did, and you can't forgive someone, God's going to say, you evil servant, I forgave you of everything. Now I'm going to let you get tortured with your sins again. I'm going to put that heaviness on you, and you are going to what? Until you decide to forgive, you are going to have my heavy hand on you. And you're not going to be forgiven. That's how God, that's how he holds it. And there's still people that just can't forgive people. Listen to what it says. Here's another one. They will slander others and have no self-control. All they do is talk about people and all they do is gratify their flesh. That's what self-control is. Self-control is not being able, not gratifying your flesh. Stop it. No, I'm not doing it. And they will be cruel and hate what is good. <laughs> if you can't see, you've got to have your head in the sand if you can't see that, because I see it inside the church, never mind out there. People are hating what's good inside churches. They say, no, don't teach me truth. I want to hear something 
<laughs> my ears, my, I'm itchy. Give me, tell me something I like. Oh, I'm blessed. The Holy Spirit loves me. Oh, thank you. Oh, here's a hundred bucks now. Could you tell me something I want to hear? I always knew I was a good person. I only come to church because it's the right thing to do. I mean, you know. I mean, I, I, I was raised to go to church, so I just go to church. I don't know, I mean, I don't know why. I don't know what I do, what I'm following, but I just go to church. It's spawn on. Why do you go to church? Well, you know, because I got raised in church. That's why I go to church. Are well, you saved? I, 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 I'm a good person. I hope I am. I hope I'm going to heaven. And, and I could be preaching this for all my whole life, and that's what people still think. Because it doesn't get in. It doesn't get in. See, the Holy Spirit gets inside a believer and starts convicting you of sin. You say, man, is there something wrong here? I got to start changing. I got to start living right. And then you say, people aren't doing it. I say, well, they don't have the Holy Spirit. Because let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit, I get convicted all the time. When my head goes into the wrong place, the Holy Spirit is like, God, what's wrong with you? Stop. Get back. Get back, and get, get back in perspective here. There's something inside me that's guiding me. It's a governor. You know when they put a governor around like a, a, a go-kart or a mini bike so it can't go too fast? Or even when you rent a car. They'll only let it go to 65 miles an hour so you can't total it. They put a governor on it. A governor what stops it. Well, the Holy Spirit's our governor that stops us from doing the misdeeds because the Holy Spirit's in us. You know what? I want to do that, but I'm not going to. The Holy Spirit, I'm just not doing it. That's what self-control is. That's how you know you're growing. Are we perfect? No. There's days that the devil gets the best, but if the devil's getting the best of you every day, you have to question, does the Holy Spirit live in me? Or does the evil spirit live in me? You ask yourself the question, I don't care. Because the evil spirit will keep, you, keep your flesh alive, but the Holy Spirit will kill it. Slowly but surely. Now, before we go on, the conflict we experience in particularly divisive political climates can em epitomize what we see in these verses. Some spout hateful language and cruel opinions, despising whatever they oppose. Don't enter in this kind of dog dialogue. Guard your heart, mind, and words. Remember that you represent Christ in your responses even when you hold strong convictions. You understand? You represent Christ and the Wayne Ministries when you're not here. See, those are the things that keep me on the straight and narrow. Understanding that it's not about me, it's about the church. I want the church to get blessed so I'm not going to fall into sin so it doesn't. You realize that your sin affects the church? If, you're, if you belong to this church and you keep living in sin, you're stopping the church from growing. You're the hindrance. You have to say, no, I gotta stop, I gotta repent. While there's still time. How about a big amen there? Now look at verse four. They will betray their friends, <laughs> be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. How do you know that somebody loves pleasure rather than God? Well, if something that that they desire falls on the time to go to church and they'd rather go there because they can't because I want to do what I want to do. I can't go to church because my pleasurable thing is up. You see, sacrifice is not doing what you want and sacrifice is not for what God wants. See, God comes first. It says we'll love pleasure rather than God. That's how you know. Why is it so tempting to love pleasure rather than God? Listen now. Pleasure is something we can control. God cannot be controlled. 
<laughs> Most pleasures could be obtained easily. Love for God requires effort and sometimes sacrifice. Pleasure benefits us now. The benefits of loving God are often in the future as delayed gratification. Pleasure has a narcotic effect, right? Taking our minds off ourselves and our problems. Love for God reminds us of our needs and our responsibilities. Pleasure conspires with pride, making us feel good when we look good in the eyes of others. Loving God means we must lay aside our pride and accomplishments. Have you chosen to love pleasure or to love God? How do you know? Pleasure isn't wrong when it is sought in connection with God, right? And the proper use of his marvelous gifts. It is only dangerous when we seek it apart from him. You see what I'm saying? When you seek it apart from God. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life, but you know what? God's with you. You can what? When you're out there, you can bring people to Jesus when you're doing something. You can talk about God to them. See? You could use it for both. You can end up having a good time and bringing people to Jesus. But sometimes they leave Jesus home when I have to have my pleasure because the things I want to do, Jesus can't come with me on this pleasure trip. I got to leave Jesus home on this because I want to do my thing. So I'm not going to talk about Jesus because I'll, I'll stain his name. Can I get an amen here? Hmm. Look what it says. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. What's the power that'll make you godly? Jesus, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit. And it says, stay away from people like that. Why do Christians still hang with unbelief people that are not godly? It tells us to stay away from them. It says, they'll act religious, but they'll reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. He's talking about even believers here. You've got to choose your friends right now in these dark days. Listen now. The act of appearance of being religious includes being a good person, exhibiting moral behaviors in agreement with our culture, showing tolerance and acceptance of sin in others, and professing to be spiritual. Some people who seem religious might even go to church, know Christian doctrine, use Christian cliches, and follow a community's Christian traditions. Such practices can make people look like Christians, but if they do not profess Jesus as Lord and Savior, the only way to God, they are not following him. A lot of people say God, but you don't hear them say Jesus. Paul warns us not to be deceived by people who appear to be Christians. Distinguishing them from true Christians may be difficult at first, but for some, their daily behavior will give them away. And over time, it will be clear that they have placed their hope not in God, but in their ability to try and be their own God. The characteristics described in chapter 3, verses 2 to 4, are unmistakable. You see how the wheat and the tears grow together in church? Everybody thinks, well, people go to church, they must be all God's children. No. No. The devil sends his minions into the church. To what? Cause discord. Yes. You know how you know? When somebody starts talking about the church or the, or the ministry or something against it to try to drive people not to come. Yep. That's how you know that the devil is working through them. When they talk about the ministry, talk about the pastor, talk about the ministry, talk about the people that are serving. That's how you know that the, devil, that the devil's working through them. And they're inside the church. We're supposed to protect each other in here. If somebody's talking about one of my brothers, I'm going to confront them and say, no, let's go get them. Talk about, tell me what you want to say in front of them. Because if you're saying it behind their back, you're gossiping. Say it in front of them. Don't go home and tell people about what's going on in church and other people. Be a man and talk to the person right up front. I 
I'll tell you. If you don't, if you don't listen, if you don't talk about the truth in the churches, it'll get infected with sin. And, and gossip is like normal. It's okay to gossip. It's not okay to gossip. I hate that. Exactly. You should hate it because nobody wants to, anybody to talk about them. So don't talk about other people. And keep 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 it here. Everybody's so quick to chirp about everything. Get a bunch of chirpers. <laughs> what are they doing in church tonight? Look, if you want to know what people are doing in church tonight, why don't you come? Yeah. Stop asking what's going on in church. Come to church. Right. And you know what? If people want to know, say, I'm not saying nothing. If you want to, want to know what's going on in church, you come. I'm keeping my mouth shut. I'm not talking about what's going on in the church. Because if you want to, all you want to do is find something to gossip about. So don't say nothing. Keep it, keep it here. Tell them you want to know what's going on in church? Come. And it could be siblings. It could be anybody. The devil, he knows how to get in. And he likes to get in family members. Look at verse 6. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and, and win their confidence <laughs> of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. See, again, the devil women, they get what, tossed about real easy because they're emotional, you see? That's why he's saying this. Now, because of their cultural background, women in the Ephesian church had received no formal religious training. They were enjoying their new freedom to study in Christian truths, but their eagerness to learn was making them targets for false teachers. Paul warned Timothy to watch out for men who would take advantage of these women. New believers need to grow in their knowledge of the word because ignorance can make them vulnerable to deception. Encourage new believers to make a daily habit of reading the Bible to avoid being led astray. Do I stress it enough that we all need to read our Bible here? I stress it enough. Paul obviously doesn't oppose the study and education. Rather, he warns Timothy about what can happen when people never really understand the core truths of their faith. That's what it is. People don't really understand the core truth of their faith. So they get, they get swept away. All right, look at verse 8. These teachers oppose the truth, just as Janus and Jambres op oppose Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janus and Jambres. Okay, according to tradition, Janus and Jambres were two of the magicians who had counterfeited Moses' miracles before Pharaoh in Exodus 7, 11 to 12. Paul explained, just as Moses had exposed and defeated them, God would overthrow the false teachers who were plaguing the Ephesians' church. We can hide our sin for a while, but eventually the truth will be revealed. Sooner or later, distraction, opposition, anger, or fatigue will wear us down and our true hearts will be exposed. The trials of life will conspire against our efforts to maintain a religious front. We can't choose when, we, when and where we will be tested by adversity. Build your character carefully because it will come out under stress. How does, how does the guy, God show us our character? Under stress. The real you comes out under stress. Live each day as if your actions will one day be known to everyone. Remember if I put everybody's actions on the screen on a Sunday? I'd be running out the door. <laughs> Live each day as if the actions will one day be known to everyone. It is useless in the middle of a test to acknowledge that you should have been prepared. Now is the time to change anything you wouldn't want revealed later. 
You see what I mean? God always, see, like I'm just giving this message now. If there's something in your life that doesn't line up with God, right now is the time that you can change it. Now you'll take a deep look at it and say, you know what? Whatever it is, I'm going to repent of it before it gets revealed publicly. Because it will come out sooner or later. So now's the time to change it. But some people are stubborn and say, nope, I'll never get caught. Okay. Never say never. <laughs> never say never. But our flesh is so strong, we keep doing things. You know why? You know why our flesh is so strong? We keep doing things till we get caught. Then we stop. While we don't get caught, we keep doing it. But then when we get caught, we stop. He said, the God says, I want to lead you by the eye, not the rod. Getting caught is the rod. By the eye, you stop before you do get caught. So you should be smart enough. Believe me, nobody gets away with anything in the Christian life. You think you're getting away with it. It will come out. All right, look at verse 10. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. He got rescued from all of it. Listen, God will rescue us for all, from everything if we trust him. Can I get an amen here? In verse 12, in this church, Paul tells Timothy that people who obey God and live for Christ will be persecuted. Don't be surprised when people misunderstand, criticize, and even try to hurt you because of what you believe and how you live. Don't give up. Continue to live as you know God wants you to. Make pleasing God your highest priority. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, make pleasing God your highest priority. In verse 13, we'll close here. But evil people and impostors will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. Impostors are flourishing in the church right now. People are studying under these false teachers. They're starting churches with false doctrine. We're not even using the um, authenticity of the Bible. They're making their own Bible. All right, we're going to close there. When we pick up, we'll go to verse 14. This is a great study. And an eye-opener, isn't it? For sure. Dave, you want to come up and close us? Yep. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, Lord, and... For this opportunity that you give to us each week, Lord, to gather together in your house, Lord, freely and hear the truth of your word, Lord. We're just so grateful for a, a pastor who constantly studies your word, Lord, in order to be able to continue to preach the truth of your word, Lord, exactly the way you intended, Lord. Regardless if anybody becomes offended or convicted, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that we've grown enough to be able to use those convicting messages, Lord, not to become bitter, Lord, but to grow stronger in our walk with you, Lord. And that we might be an example to those around us as to what it truly means to live a changed life. And Lord, I just pray for those who might not be saved, Lord, or who are wayward, Lord, that they might be convicted of their need for Jesus as their Savior, Lord. And I just pray that you might somehow reveal to them the eternal torment that awaits if they don't turn to you before it's too late, Lord. And I just pray for this church and our families, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those who are sick, Lord, that you might have your healing hands upon them, Lord, and comfort them, reassure them you never leave them nor forsake them, and that you're with them always. And I just pray this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Dave. All right. We're going to watch a video, and we are going to close.